Hello, everyone, on a Saturday morning, and Happy New Year. It is a blessing to be here, and I would just like to welcome you as part of uh, the Executive Director for Community Network Council here in Kent, Washington. We're a local organization. We work with uh, schools uh, seeking academic excellence for our students, for our youth. And on that note, and if you need to learn more about CNC, um, I ask you to go to our website and Aubrey can put it in the uh, chat. But on that note, we'll just, I'll turn it over to Dr. Eddie Moore, who's been collaborating with CNC for the past couple of years, doing our um, teaching, our, uh, I'm sorry, our class, our professional development program with the teachers. So on that note, I'll turn it over to Dr. Moore. All right, all right, thank you. We're gonna give a shout out to Aubrey who's handling all the technology. Aubrey, we appreciate you on the front side, on the back side, on the side, and, and, and all the other ways that you're helping out. Thank you, Barbara, it's so, gra so great to be here with CNC. I'm just so happy about this partnership. And this program today is an example of why. I mean, I just think there's no more important time than now that we need to be talking about this topic. And I just can't, I mean, just personally take it lightly around what's going on in our nation from politics. We just, you know, had the January 6th um, year commemorating the insurrection. Uh, mm -hmm. I've lost track of how many years we've been in the pandemic. I mean, people are renaming it the endemic uh, just because it seems like it's here forever. And you got, you know, and we can't take it lightly, the weather and the climate and what's happening across the nation in reference to people just having their everyday lives disrupted uh, by some things. And um, as we celebrate the new year, 2022, uh, I do think Aubrey and I were talking about just how important it is to just remember the little things, the just blessings we have to be awake, to be alive. And so, we don't take it lightly that y'all are spending this Saturday with us. And I'm so happy to be able to share with y'all a good friend. Uh, Dr. June can talk a little bit about, you know, her title and her credentials, but this is a sister that's really helped me with this self-care thing. Uh, what it means, how to practice it, how to believe it, how to breathe it, and not just say self-care, but to participate in self-care. And I'm so excited about the title, Satisfaction. I mean, I'm just ready to hear more about that. So it is with great pleasure I introduce to the CNC family, friends, a good friend, a good sister, Dr. June Christian. June, welcome. Uh, if you can just give a quick intro so folks know I didn't just find you on the internet and emailed you and asked you to come on board. Uh, and then, you know, the floor is yours and we're so excited to have you here today. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it, um, Dr. Moore. I, I almost called you Eddie. I think that's okay in this space. Thank you very much for having me. And I wanna extend a very heartfelt thank you for the opportunity to have this conversation to Barbara. And I appreciate your heavy lifting, uh, Lieutenant Aubrey. Um, it is such a wonderful opportunity to have this conversation. Um, to give you a little bit about who I am, I my professional life started in education. I was a middle school teacher. And I think they say, you know, you're, you're definitely called for the population that you teach. So I was not called for kindergartners and accidents. And I wasn't called for um, high schoolers who are really shaping their identity and independence. I liked middle schoolers because there were no accidents and they still wanted to give hugs. So it was such a wonderful opportunity to do so. And from that, it led me to graduate work. Um, I have received a, uh, a graduate certificate in American culture from Washington University in St. Louis. That graduate certificate gave me the opportunity to see exactly what this thing is. And by this thing, I mean the culture, the milieu, what we are all participating in right now as we bring ourselves to this conversation and in varying degrees of vulnerability and authenticity. Um, I also uh, started as a researcher. 
And my research centers around multi-generation, multi-generational education trauma. Um, I actually wrote a book about it. It was my uh, dissertation research and Lexington Books was kind enough to publish it. Um, and I don't mind if you're interested in it, please, by all means, get the bootleg. I'm not making any money off of it. So, um, but in that, I, I took a look at all of these Black folks and people of color privileging those voices to really understand racism. I think oftentimes we have an understanding of racism from a privilege, a point of privilege and power, but not from the voices of the people who are experiencing it. And so when you've got the phenomenal W.E.B. Du Bois who started, um, shortly after slavery, cataloging the experience of not just Black folks, but of race in America, it really helped me to better understand um, the context, this culture that, that we live in, uh, intersperse a little bit of post-traumatic slave syndrome, critical race theory, um, and not just the, the highs and lows, right, in terms of these conversations that we're having about critical race theory now, but actually digging into the law, understanding Richard, Richard Delgado, Gene Stephens, uh, Stefanchik, and uh, Derek Bell, and Kimberly Cranshaw. So I, um, I understand trauma, I understand education, I understand how we racialize, colonize, and then globalize race, racism um, and all of the other uh, points of privilege that some of us experience and some of us, some of us are on the receiving end of. So that work helped me to better understand that sometimes our point of entry into liberation is the self. I was just sharing with Eddie and Barbara and Aubrey. Um, Desmond Tutu is very uh, top of mind for me right now, as, as are Lonnie Guineer and Bell Hooks, these intellectual forebears who went before us. Um, but Desmond Tutu describes the South African humanist philosophy of Ubuntu. Anytime you are hurt, harmed, or diminished, I am hurt, harmed, and diminished. And I believe that the converse of that is true. I call it the Ubuntu corollary. Anytime you are he healthy, healing, and whole, I am too. So what does it look like to not only understand and explore um, the disadvantages that some of us face as a result of our identities, but also to get the upper hand and to recognize the personal power that we have in shaping our lives and impacting the lives of the people who are around us, who are closest to us, who love us best and who we love. Um, and that has a ripple effect out um, because we can get so mired in the negative that we forget that part of this journey is liberatory. It is centered on our own liberation and that experience of liberation so we can live life abundantly and more fully. So that is a little bit about me. I'm gonna share my screen with you all if that is okay. So, this seems to be, I think sometimes we have an idea of, you know, what satisfaction is. And in some circles, we think of it, we associate it with those things that are taboo that we don't speak about in a business setting, or we don't speak about professionally. But I think that satisfaction is something that is really about who we are at the core of who we are, not this kind of flighty, you know, external exploration of satisfaction. So before we get into thinking through satisfaction, I first want to start with what is self-care? Um, I would love to hear if anyone feels so inclined to share. When you think of self-care, what do you think of? I like an interactive presentation because the one thing that I know about satisfaction is that is it is unique to everyone who is assembled here. So what satisfies me may not satisfy anyone else here. And that's true for any of us. So before we take a step there, let's think through what is self-care. If you, if you don't have necessarily a definition, perhaps, and feel free to unmute, perhaps you have activities or words that you associate with self-care. So I would love if maybe two or three folks who feel so inclined would come off mute and share. Sure, Aubrey. You know, so, so since we've been doing this series, um, to me, you know, I started to form my idea of what self-care is. 
And, and it seems to me that the, I, you know, for me, self-care means the ability to really unplug and recover. You know what I mean? Like we do a lot and, and oftentimes we really can't stop doing stuff and we continue to get run down even when we're not doing the stuff that, you know, is obvious because our minds are thinking about doing the next thing and, or our problems, or our issues. And to me, I think just being able to really, to really unplug and just recover without the brain going and the mind going, that, that's kind of what I, I'm learning or I, my definition that's forming of self-care so far. That's awesome. Thanks, Aubrey. The, the ability to unplug and to recover, um, which indicates, right, all of the things that we are engaging with that Eddie brought up in the beginning, right? It's not just um, climate change. It's not just our political siloed experience right now. It's not just all of the other things that are going on professionally. There are also things that hit close to home. So how are we recovering from the things that that take our energy? That, that ability to unplug means that so, at some point you're plugged into something. And that being plugged into something means that there's an electric current, there's energy there. Um, so that's that's a, um, I appreciate that, Aubrey, thank you. Eddie says, doing things that make me happy. Um, if you feel comfortable unmuting Eddie, what are some of those things? Yeah, you know, I was first gonna say is, um, you know what, COVID has really helped me to understand it. Now, I, I think I knew this as an educator, as a parent, as a teacher, as a scholar, you know, that your behavior impacts your kids, right? Like young people watch what you do, all that kind of stuff. But COVID put my kids so doggone close to me for so long. Mm -hmm. And they're still there, they're still there. I, I, I haven't experienced this since my kids have been born, that they are with, they are there all the time. Mm -hmm. And there are times when I feel like I'm gonna lose my mind. Mm -hmm. It is, it is, it's been so amazing to watch this, how this has impacted me, uh, but also how my behavior around this has impacted my kids. And so all of that to say there's been frustration, there's been, there's been snapping, there's been swearing, there's been storming off all the stuff that I can see ripple and impact my kids. And gets me to my point where I've had to make sure that I've done things to make me happy so I can come back and apologize so that they can see me smile, they can hear me laugh. And so I think sometimes for me, what makes me happy is just a silly movie, some fun time, some family time that's just silly. And like Aubrey said, away from email and with my phone down. Uh, for me also golfing, you know, getting outside, doing some walking, you know, it's just been really important for me to take care of myself in a physical way as well. Uh, so I just think for me, trying to do the things, whether it's a small thing like a movie or a cup of coffee or a little bit of dessert, uh, but something that just makes me smile because I see, I can see how the things that frustrate me, that make me mad, that sometimes make me do some things that I need to think through better, but I didn't, is impacting the people around me, especially young people, my kids, and trying to balance that, counter that, is what I've been thinking a lot about over this last year, particularly with this series as well. So I said a lot, but that's, that's some of where that statement comes from. I love it. Right. So what I hear in your statement and yours too, Aubrey, is this sense of wholeness, right? So when we are spending time with other people, we are giving parts of ourselves. And when you've got shadows and not your actual shadows, right, Eddie, when you've got children or partners or people that you live with, and we're not, we don't have breaks anymore as a result of the pandemic. And you compound that with just the sheer experience of living in a pandemic, right? What are the things that make us whole? And I, I really wanna start helping you to think around 
satisfaction as perhaps not something that is outside of you, but something that is inside of you, something that you can maintain. And we'll get into that in just a moment. Maria, you said limit, limited the news and go to explore a new place. You get into that curiosity, right? Because it seems as though you know everything in the four walls that you're, you're living in or the grocery store, because we have such limited paths now. Um, we're trying to track our exposure um, to this virus for many of us. And so that the idea of going exploring and also limiting the news. Maria, if you wouldn't mind unmuting and saying perhaps what limiting the news has helped you to experience or to notice um, before you were limiting the news. Oh, can you unmute? <laughs> There you go. Now you can hear me? Yes. Well, first of all, um, this is my first time in, um, I'm a current student in a Highline College pursuing my bachelor degree in youth development. Mm -hmm. And um, for me, limited the new says because every network they have a kind of impact, like they have a, a specific form to, announce every time, put it like a more spicy and then now we have these, now the variant they could they transfer in another thing. It's like a, a, a word of confusion, especially for my grandchildren and me. I never see, or I never live in my long time, something like that, like a word pandemic is new for every single human in this earth. So we don't know how to tackle that. We don't know how to act. And especially when the news, I discovered that I'm a Mexican, mostly my fellow Mexican, my culture, they got so concerned because the television says that. Mm -hmm. And I told them, we don't need to listen to the television. The television don't always say the truth. No, but Dr. Fauci was there to say, yes, I know we need to follow the guidelines for the CDC, but not for the network. Mm -hmm. They got paid for being sensationalists. And when this new variant, the Omicron, trust me, my community is freaking out. Mm -hmm. I, I heard four families in my community that ready packed to things and go back to Mexico. Do you see how much affect this to people? They affect whatever they say in television, they affect everybody in some point. Sure. So for me, limited self-care is, I mean, stay away from the news or the Facebook or all that stuff, try to, in my free time, go to places like I love to explore new places like uh, last week I was in Moro. I never been in Moro, but that was like a very amazing because they have uh, these little stores. That's a self-care. I disconnect for the world mm -hmm. and I was in my own pad and I just find these little things that make me, I'm a very curious person. So that's a very good, good self-care for me. And I, when I returned from my trip, I was like, ah, oh, man, let's go begin in the new week. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's for me that works. That I appreciate that because one of the things that you bring to the fore, Maria, is the sense of self-awareness. Right. Yeah. So I know what works best for me. And for many of us, we are told not to trust those voices. Right. So it's go get your hair done, go get a pedicure, yes. go do these things, as opposed to being very self-aware, knowing I have a threshold with regard to how much I can stand. So there's a difference between being informed and tracking each death right, as we yeah. are moving in this pandemic. And, you know, at this point, hearing the news, just learning to live with it. And so that sense of self-awareness, and I just, I want to mention something, um, Eddie, that I saw, you mentioned exercise and going to play golf, uh, getting outside and moving your body. There was just a TED talk 
And the woman who um, talked, to, she talked about exercise. I, I don't remember her name, but it's a, it's a newer TED talk. Um, and the benefits of moving your body. So if golf isn't your thing, if running isn't your thing, if walking isn't your thing, figuring out what feels good in terms of moving your body is super helpful because it helps you focus. It helps to decrease your heart rate. And so when you are engaging with things around you, your shadow, your partner, your kids, any of those things, that exercise helps you to create equilibrium, that the movement helps you to create equilibrium. And I just, as as the health coach in me (laughs) wants to say in this moment that it's not about the strenuousness of the exercise. It is simply about the movement. So if you're a dancer, if you're a walker, if you just want to do jazz hands for a couple of minutes every day, being able to move and being self-aware and focused on that. So I'm going to move to the next slide. And I just, I wanted to share with you, because I think this is an interesting definition that comes from the World Health Organization. And they say that self-care is the ability of individuals and families, individuals, families, and communities to promote health prevent disease, maintain health, and to cope with illness and disability with or without the support of a healthcare provider. Now, of course, healthcare providers are certainly important, but self-care is your choice. It is how you choose to move in the world. It is your ability to take care, to care for your health, to invest Um, in your health. And sometimes, you know, I want to go back to the idea. I have a a very dear friend who talks about self-care and I don't, um, when she talks about self-care, she talks about it in terms of going to get her hair done, going to get her nails done, going to get a massage. And I think that these are valuable tools when it comes to self-care, but I really want us to think about what do those tools provide for us? So it's not necessarily the activity, it's the outcome. It is the ability to take that time. It is the feeling of being pampered or the feeling of caring for yourself, giving this over to someone where this is their expertise. Um, Self-massage is a wonderful thing. I used to be a a licensed massage therapist, um, but it's almost impossible to massage yourself, especially your shoulders. So going to a massage therapist, someone who has this expertise and turning this over to them and being able to trust yourself to trust others um, is, is huge. So now you may be wondering, so what does satisfaction have to do with self-care? Because it would seem as though satisfaction is an outcome. Um, So I'm just, I would love to have one person, if you feel so inclined, unmute and tell me what you think, what is the definition of satisfaction? And, and you don't have to give me a definite uh, dictionary definition. You can give me a, um, a personal definition. How would you define satisfaction? Complete my assignment from school. That's a satisfaction weekend. <laughs> yep. Complete your assignment. That's yes. fair. I, I appreciate that, Maria. And I have to say, this is a little bit of a trick question. So for many of us, when we think about satisfaction, we think about it as something that is external to who we are. So when I get the job, when I finish the assignment, when I spend time with my, with my kids, with my students, with my partner, when I don't spend time with those folks, when I'm alone, when it's always something that is external to who we are, it's not inside of us. And I would encourage you to think about turning the dial. So what does it look like if satisfaction is something that is in within me, if it is the choice I make to engage with the world? So rather than waiting for satisfaction, because I think that that's a mindset. If you are looking for satisfaction outside of who you are, outside of your experience, you will likely never experience it because you are, once you get to that goal, you set another benchmark, you set another goal, and you're off in pursuit of that. So satisfaction is something that is in the, in the 
distance, right? In the background, it's far away and you're constantly traveling toward it. But what if you could embody satisfaction? And I want you to think about the people who love you best. And what would it mean if you interacted with them, if you loved them, if you experienced them and allowed them to experience you when you're satisfied? And just shot, uh, just a, a reminder, your satisfaction is different. So Maria, when you say, oh my goodness, completing that assignment, that's satisfaction for me. So I'm done with an assignment. I don't know that I will ever complete an assignment again in my whole life. Like, I don't want to do school. We are done. I like learning, but assignments, that's not going to be satisfaction for me. And that's okay. When you get into the habit of comparing satisfaction, right? So, oh, well, this is, you know, Francis is going to get a massage and that's going to satisfy her but I don't like massage. I don't like people in my personal space. That's <laughs> no. not satisfaction for me. So really being conscious around understanding that your satisfaction, your satisfaction is unique to you. And it's just like your DNA. It's just like your thumbprint. It, no one else has the same qualifiers for satisfaction. So I want to take us to Maslow's hierarchy, because I think this will better help us understand satisfaction to give us a really good, good insight into the definition of satisfaction that isn't something that's taboo that we shouldn't talk about in this space, but that is really something that's grounded in who we are and how we live our lives. So Maslow comes up with a hierarchy of needs, and I think it's important to reference for human motivation. So these are the things that we need to be motivated to live our best lives, to really have an expansive um, experience of life and of the people who surround us. So at the bottom of the pyramid, you'll notice physiological, and that's misspelled. I see that now. I apologize. But just know it's physiological. These are your basic needs. So it's do you have uh, shelter, food, clean water? clean air, these basic physiological needs. Are you healthy? Do you have access to health? Second is safety. So are you financially secure? Are you psychologically safe? And most importantly, are you physically safe in your surroundings? The next level, belonging and love. This is your community. Are you surrounded by people who love you? And are you able to give love in return? Are, do you have a community? Do you feel safe, that psychological safety? All of these things are mutually reinforcing. Do you feel safe in that community? And then the, the next level up is esteem. So do you feel confident? Do you feel capable? Do you feel competent? These are key to moving into this self-actualization. So oftentimes the aesthetic needs, the self-actualization and the transcendence are all referred to as self-actualization. And this is your ability to move out into the world and to get the things, to experience the things that you really enjoy, that really set your heart on fire, that align with your passion and your purpose. But let's drop down because I have that dotted line um, right above esteem. If the physiological safety, belonging and love and esteem needs are not met, then you will constantly seek to fill those needs. So rather than moving into this experience of life that is grand, that is of your own design, that motivates you to align with and to move toward your passion and purpose, you'll be constantly in the search for safety, do I feel safe? How can I feel safe? Do I feel competent? Do I feel capable? And oftentimes we outsource our feelings of esteem, right? Of, of competency and of capability. Am I worthy? Those, those questions fall there. And if we aren't feeling good, solid, if those needs aren't satisfied, and I want to I want to make the distinction between satisfaction and fulfillment. 
So I will think about satisfaction as breathing. Think about fulfillment as a deep breath. Do you notice the nuance between the two? So breathing is something that happens. It is your body's natural response and it keeps you alive. It keeps the energy flowing. Fulfillment is the deep breath, perhaps followed by a sigh, right? That's a, oh, you're full, right? And, and breathing is important, period. But if you're not satisfied, if you're not breathing, in these areas and you don't have to take a deep breath that's not what we're asking just breathing in these areas then you'll constantly you're constantly looking to catch your breath and you can't take a deep breath because you're looking to fulfill those needs so i'd love for you to think about satisfaction as a change management model what are you talking about june so life comes at you fast there are so many things in life and we've touched on those things. Um, the pandemic is chief among them, but also the way that we're engaging, how siloed we are as individuals, the identities that keep us apart from each other or that we are um, taught should keep us apart. And then just the, the general living of life. We are in an, in an era where we are surrounded by death. There are constant conversations about death. And for many of us, that death has hit closer to home than we'd like. Life is always happening. And you may think, well, when life is happening, how can I be satisfied? If you don't put satisfaction outside of you, if you turn that dial and you embed satisfaction within you, and we'll get to some ways of how to get to satisfaction, your own individual satisfaction in just a moment. But if you've got this lens of satisfaction, then life passes through that lens. You experience more ease and flow. There's less resistance. So I'll give you an example. Um, my mother was diagnosed with dementia in 2017. We have been, my sister and I have been caring for her full time uh, for the past almost five years, nearly five years. And it is very easy to be dissatisfied with life, watching the decline um, of my mother, who was my greatest champion and my best friend. Uh, but if I take satisfaction and I don't place it in her health, in her ability to exchange with me and support me in ways that she once did. And I embed that in myself. What can I look at across my life and say, I'm satisfied with this. I, I don't need to look for anything outside of me to handle this. I am equipped to, to engage with my emotions, to fully feel my emotions. And there is a sanctity and a beauty in life that is at the core of our humanity, of our very humanity. If I can get centered in that, then it changes the way I engage with my mother, the frustration and the impatience that I may experience as a result of caring for her and seeing the cognitive changes that are taking place. Um, that, you know, things that she would never have allowed us to do as children, that she's now doing, right, as, as these cognitive changes are taking place. Um, being able to move out of that judgment and move into enjoying the time that I have to spend with her and giving myself the grace to say, you're going to be frustrated, you're going to be sad, you're experiencing waves of grief, and what's going well in life? What's shifting and changing about your experience that you can control? And when you get into that, remember going back to our conversation, that self-awareness, the idea that you are whole in and of yourself, you don't have to put that on your partner or your kids or your degree or your professional attainment. And really thinking about what it looks like. Satisfaction helps ease and flow. It, um, reduces resistance. 
it also increases the quality of your experience. So when you can say to yourself, I am completely satisfied with life right now, that doesn't mean that you don't have goals in the future. That doesn't mean that you aren't pursuing passion and purpose moving forward. It means that right here, right now, are you happy with what's going on around you? Are you safe? Are your physiological needs met? Are you, do you have access to community, right? Because sometimes when we're alone, community may not be around us, but do you have access to it? If you needed to call someone, if you needed such space, if you needed the, re the affirmation of your humanity, do you have access to it? And are you competent and capable? By virtue of be, being in the world, I would say so. You know, all of us, none of us are babies. So at some point, the responsibility for living our lives fell to us um, and our parents began to support as, as opposed to um, orchestrating that experience of life. And so if we are here at this point, then that means that we are capable of supplying our own needs, of fulfilling, of satisfying our own needs. So this satisfaction, this lens of satisfaction really does help to increase the quality of our experience of life. It doesn't mean that we won't experience sadness, frustration, anger, um, depression, but it does mean that we can experience those things as an understanding that this is the fullness of life. It's not detracting from our life. It isn't impairing our, our lives. It's not impairing or impeding upon our satisfaction. We control that within us. And then lastly, the point of attraction. One of the things that I've never really understood in life, but it's, it's a thing, is that celebrities will go places and they will often enjoy free things. And it seems as though if you are someone who gets paid $20 million or more for a record, for a movie, um, that you would be able to, to afford your meal, your movie, whatever it, whatever it is that you're experiencing. But that point of attraction, right, in terms of this is how I choose to live my life. And when people see that, they're attracted to it. When you're satisfied, you think, just envision someone that you think of as satisfied right now. They live their lives kind of from this model. What you assume is their level of satisfaction, they're living it. How are they engaging in the world? How does the world engage them? Are they living a well-rounded, engaging life? Or do they seem to be withdrawn? Odds are, if you say that they're satisfied with their experience of life, they aren't withdrawn. They're having a full human experience, but they're attracting to them a life that feels good. That level of satisfaction also models for the people who love you best how to find their own satisfaction. And so when you think about now you're living in satisfaction and your community is approaching their own satisfaction, it's priceless. Now we are starting to move toward liberation. Now we are starting to move toward health and healing and wholeness and happiness that isn't controlled by external stimuli that, rest and reside, that rests and resides in us. So I'd love for you to think about on a scale of one to 10, where 10 is completely satisfied, how satisfied are you with your life? One of the questions, this is the question when I work with clients around satisfaction, when I work with uh, leaders around satisfaction, it's the question that I almost, that I ask off the top, how satisfied are you with, with your life? What I find is that most people, most people will put themselves at a six, right? So they're not middle of the road, but they're like a six, maybe a seven, um, no judgment, if you are not a six or a seven, if you're a 10, if you're a zero or a one, it's all good um, because you can increase satisfaction no matter 
where you are in this, uh, where you are on the continuum. So think about it. How satisfied are you with your life? And then the follow-up question, if it's not a 10, why not a 10? When you consider why not a 10, you are able to engage with the hurdles. You are in, you are able to engage with those things that are blocking you, with the external stimuli that you're using to control your experience. So thinking through what satisfaction feels like in your body, in the interest of time, I would, I would love to facilitate um, the somatic experience of satisfaction, but you can do this um, on your own time. When was the last time you felt satisfied with your life or even a modicum of satisfaction? And really, when you have a moment, really sit in that and allow yourself to notice where do you feel that in your body? I have a what I call a satisfaction practice that I do every morning. And once I had this feeling in my body, you create a neural pathway, right? <gasps> Ding, your brain goes, this is satisfaction for you. And you probably haven't had this touch point. So you've experienced satisfaction, but you haven't gone searching for it. So when your brain goes, oh my goodness, this is the experience of satisfaction and you feel it in your body. I feel satisfaction in what I've labeled my soul on the back side of my heart, between the back side of my heart and the, and the uh, back side of and my back body, right? So just um, underneath my heart, that's where I experience satisfaction. So when I wake up in the morning, I set a timer for two minutes at least, and I allow my body to explore satisfaction. And what does it feel like if I double that feeling, that experience in my body? And then if I multiply it by 10, and then 10 again, and then 10 again, and it sets me up for a day that no matter what I encounter, I can go back to that feeling. Now I can leverage within my own body, within my own mind, when I'm engaging with things that have the potential to impede my satisfaction, I can go back to that feeling. I can say, oh, this is, this is satisfaction in my body. And also recognizing as you carve out that neural pathway that it's not going to be as strong all the time, but the more you are like, oh, I'm noticing satisfaction in my life, then that awareness helps you to reflect. Awareness leads to reflection. That reflection leads to reflection reflexivity. I would say reflection, but it sounds the same. The reflection like in a mirror leads to being reflexive. Reflexive is a quality of reflection where you take that reflection, you understand your analysis, and then you use that analysis to shape your life, to change, to create action, to really dig in that neural pathway. So now you are encountering and experiencing life on your terms in the way that you choose to define it, just like it is as unique and as splendid and as profound as your DNA and your, your fingerprints, now you're starting to engage with life through that satisfaction lens that is solely yours, that invites other people um, to experience their lives authentically and vulnerable, vulnerably as well. So, Life, going back to this um, change management model. So going over to ease and flow and experiencing less resistance. Another part of my satisfaction process is I am completely satisfied with, I take a moment to journal this. And I would encourage you to do this as well. And I, I'm not sure how, um, how this might work, but I would love to, if it's easier for folks, um, who have the recording, I can also send over the slide deck so that um, you can have access to really working with these questions. So thinking about, I am completely satisfied with, and this is a shift in the way that you're thinking about it. So saying, I'm completely satisfied with being frustrated by the news. 
every day. So rather than thinking of it as, oh, I'm completely satisfied, you're thinking about it in terms of, I'm done with this. And when you signal to your body, when you signal to your brain, when you signal to your spirit, I'm done with this. Now you've got a point of departure. So what's next? So now you've got to be satisfied in a different way. So thinking about that in terms of ease and flow, what can you release? I am completely satisfied in the thing you want to release so that you can relax into ease and flow and find a different way of experiencing it or of experiencing life. The next one, I'm satisfied with right? This is an increased quality of your experience. So I'm satisfied with these particular areas of life. You can align that with gratitude, right? I'm so satisfied with the way that I have created community in my life, with my experience of receiving and giving love. I'm satisfied with that and really being expansive and able to sit in that. So if you are unable to identify satisfaction in your body, this gives you another entry point. So what are you satisfied with? I am not satisfied with my with the relationship that I have with my mother right now, but I am satisfied with my ability to make peace with her. I am satisfied with my ability to spend time with her. I am satisfied with my experience to care for her in ways, in ways similar to how she cared for me. And then lastly, that point of attraction piece. Thinking through, I find blank so satisfying, or I find blank satisfying. So now rather than a process of, grat of, of gratitude in the, in the prior um, increased quality of experience, we move into appreciation. So what are you appreciating? I'm, I, find, I find summer really satisfying. I find warm weather really satisfying, especially on a day when it's 38 degrees in Missouri. So what can you appreciate? I, I find playing with my dog in the morning satisfying. I find my satisfaction, pro, uh, my satisfaction practice so satisfying. And so thinking about this in terms of what do you want to release? What are you grateful for? And what are you appreciating? So now this isn't something that's external. It's not based on things that are out there. Now it's about you and you being able to cultivate a practice that feels good to you so that you can care for yourself. So no matter what's coming your way, you have lenses to live your life that allow you to step into the fullness of life, to care for yourself, to model liberation, the movement, the process, the strategy toward liberation, uh, as opposed to allowing life to kind of, you know, beat you up. As I think many, many of our um, models, current models would suggest, Right, like, so how can you be proactive in encountering life as opposed to reactive? So I, thinking about um, your experience of the talk and wondering, are you satisfied with the experience that you've had to this point? As we move into uh, conversation and, and Q&A and uh, that, are you satisfied? And if you aren't, how can you get there? What question can you ask that may move you closer to satisfaction? What experience do you need to have in the time that we have left together to feel satisfaction, to experience satisfaction, and to care for yourself? So I think it is time for us to move into uh, Q and A with Dr. Moore, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And I'm here. I'm open. Ah, thank you, thank you, thank you, June. We're gonna give you a little emoji love here. 
little emoji love there. Say thank you there. There's my little emoji love. Y'all give a little emoji love to our, our CNC newest family member, uh, 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 Sister Dr. June. Um, uh, uh, I and Aubrey, but others. I mean, we always like to follow up with some questions and. Uh, I got a couple over here, and I just want to encourage y'all in the audience, if you want to ask any questions, you can uh, unmute or show your picture, unmute, and uh, send it, or you can send it in the chat. Aubrey is always monitoring the chat as well, um, and I want to go right at your uh, question about am I satisfied with this presentation, and I'm going to say no, because it's so new. I mean, it feels it feels so new to me, June. That's why it just doesn't feel like, I feel like I just want to run out of the room and say, I don't, I want to pretend I heard none of that because it's so hard for me to be thinking about what you're saying. And I'm wondering how you get people to really begin to get comfortable with self-care, satisfaction. What's, what's the time frame? Because I feel like this has just been something so far outside of my normal thinking, my normal care. So what's been your experience with getting people to be comfortable with this topic, self-care satisfaction? So I, I would encourage you to think about it like um, reading. Um, because when you first started reading before, well, you didn't start reading. You started recognizing patterns. Then you started assigning letters or you started recognizing letters. Then you started making words. Then you started making sentences. Then you started reading sentences, right? So thinking about it that way. And this is a society that is not centered on caring for self. We live in a, in a model where our work, um, our work ethic, our work product are valued over the wholeness of our humanity. And so really it's a shift in paradigm. More than anything, it's about the commitment. So if we go into it with this excitement, because for the most part, many of us are really excited to engage in learning, even if it's not reading, to engage in learning of some type. So if we can get to the point where we're thinking about it in terms of, oh my gosh, I am learning a new skill. It goes back to the development of that neural pathway. The, the cool thing about the brain is that you can develop so many different ways of getting to a thing, right? So if it's not the experience, the somatic experience in your cells, in your tissue, then ask yourself the questions. So what are you completely satisfied? What do you need to see change with? What are you grateful for? What are you appreciating? And if you're committed, if you are committed to, to having a different experience of life, right? One that is obvious in its impact on longevity, on health, um, and on your community, the people who are around you, it improves your quality of life. If you're, if you're committed to improving your quality of life, then it's just a little at a time. And it's giving yourself the grace to fully expand into this. So if, if you are completely satisfaction adverse, that's fine. But what's your word, right? What, what lens are you going to use to, to live your life through so that you are not discombobulated by life? And we are in a, in a time period where things just pop up. Like, I never would have expected a pandemic in my lifetime, ever, ever. Even though um, uh, Barack Obama and Joe Biden put together, you know, the, the, um, some kind of playbook for the Trump administration in the event a pandemic happened, right? So there's forward thinking, but we're not always kept abreast of everything that, that the powers that be know. So it just comes up and now we're like, well, what do we do? So if we get really committed, really committed to, to saying to ourselves, I want, I want a quality of life that I enjoy. I wanna be able to experience my children, my partner, my job, my, my educational experience 
from this space. Will it happen overnight? I'd love to say yes. And if it doesn't, then how do you start building that practice over time? Yeah. Uh, I'm going to ask one more question before uh, I see. I don't know, Arv, if you raise your hand there, but I, I, I just had to, I got to ask this one about specifically, I think, blue collar folks, folks who come from working communities, so to speak, like I came from a working mama, two or three jobs that taught me and talked to me about having two or three jobs where I thought satisfaction was work, jobs. Mm -hmm you know, just doing things to make life better for others. That's mm -hmm. what I thought. That's where I saw it, my satisfaction and pouring myself into my work, into the work of helping others. And I, I'm trying to get better at recalibrating that, reconsidering that, because it sounds like you're saying self-care is selfish. Yes. And it doesn't feel right. No, 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 no. I wouldn't me, say, I wouldn't say selfish. I would say it's self full. Okay. 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 So okay. when you are, a, it, you know, everybody talks about filling from, you can't fill from an empty cup or if you're on the plane, right? Like you've got to secure your oxygen mask before you can help anyone else. And for many of us, our work product, our, um, our work ethic, that is what determines our worth. And that isn't true. That is not true, right? Going back to, to the dearly departed ancestor, uh, Desmond Tutu, right? We are human because we are. My, the very validation of my humanity is not my ability to do work. It's not my ability to provide. It is my humanness. And my humanness is located in you. So when we shift, all of these cultural paradigms start to shift with us. So when you think about satisfaction in terms of working, that's not satisfaction. I would say that there's something that's underlying that. It is the feeling of, of completion. It is the adding to right? It's not necessarily the action, it's the feeling. So if we can remove action and just feel, feel it, get into that feeling. So now we're in this feeling, how are we engaging with the world? It shifts everything. It shifts the way that you engage with the people who love you best. And you'll notice in the, oh my goodness, there's something that is qualitatively shifted about how we're engaging with each other. And I like it. I don't know what it is, but I like it. And I want to continue to feel that. So maybe we take a step back from thinking about it as something that's external and we take a step inside and think about it. What are the feelings? Right. So when you think about that time when you were satisfied, when you're looking to experience that in your body, maybe it was the day that your children were born, right? Like that, that sense of satisfaction or that feeling that all was right with the world. Maybe it was an academic accomplishment. Everything was right with the world. Drop the thing and get the feeling. So how did I feel? Now, what would, it, what would it feel like to engage the world from that feeling? Oh, but I can't hold it, right? Like I can only touch it for 30 seconds, but 30 seconds is longer than nothing. And so when you focus, when you get that commitment, right? It's the 30 seconds. And so now can I extend it to 31 seconds? What about 35? Am I ready for, oh, not ready for a minute. What about 41? And so it is the ability to want to work with yourself. And the beauty of this is that I think all of us have pe younger people who are around us. I think young people do this really, really well. Young people are really great at being self full until we teach them to erase themselves oftentimes. And then like, let's not even include the, the, um, the confluence of identities on that, right? So how, how much good feeling can we have as a result of our identities? So 
what do what do we how do we feel it and so it's not necessarily remember it's not about the external stimuli this is totally about you and it's your lens to develop and it doesn't require that you do things you don't have to do anything except to feel and that's who we are as human beings Can I ask my question, Dr. Moore? You're good. I'm ready to dive in. So I have a question. So when I think of satisfaction, right, the, 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 the words that come to mind is a full belly, right? I don't know why. I like to eat. But I think um, how, how do people, or is there a line that separates a person's satisfaction, you know, when we're saying one to 10, Right, how you feel one to 10. So I feel very high, like, you know, nine. My New Year's resolution is going to get me all the way to 10. I need to drop a few pounds or whatever. But my satisfaction with life is based on things that are measurable, right? I feel like, I, you know, I'm secure, you know, back to Maslow's hierarchy, right? I'm, I'm all the way up there. I'm secure. I got people who love me. I got food. I, I, I feel like I have some choices that I can look at every day, oh, you know, from where I am in life. When, when you think of it being, you know, the lens that a person looks, a person gauges their satisfaction through this lens, is it possible or do you suggest people separate themselves from the things that you can measure, right? And, and I think that that's what we're talking about. If it's intrinsic, right? If it's something that's in you, mm -hmm. it shouldn't have to be like, oh, I got a great job. Oh, I got this. But how, how, how do people do that? Like if I didn't, if I was hungry, you know, can people, you know, still find that satisfaction? You know what I mean? Sure. So I would, I would encourage folks to look at those. Do you, are your physiological needs met? Do you feel safe? Do you have community? Do you feel competent and capable? And so one of the things that I noted, Aubrey, you said you're pretty high on the list. You're going to drop a few pounds and you'll get even higher. That's external. That's external to who you are. So what if you didn't do one more thing? What if you were just right in this moment, you were satisfied. You don't have to do anything else. You don't have to be anything else. It is the experience of life and, and life abundantly that allows us to engage. So it is intrinsic, but we often, I think for many of us, we often fight it. We are often fighting that need, that impulse to, okay, I, I do think that there's an element of satisfaction that allows us to pursue the things that we want, right? That allow us to align with our passion and our purpose. It's not static. And it's also not based upon our ability to get to that thing, right? So now our worth or our value is hinges upon, well, did I accomplish the thing that's on my list? Well, what if you throw the list away? Now, how do we practice satisfaction without the list? How do we, how do we care for ourselves in a way that we cherish and we love ourselves and we get delighted in the profundity of our own humanity? And when we have that delight, we advance toward liberation and we encourage other people to do the same. Thank you for that. Sure. I have a follow-up. Does anyone else have a question before I ask? So I was just wondering uh, also, so, you know, I'm a child of the 70s or 80s. I never know how that works. But remember when we had like the Cold War? And I, I mean, I don't know if you remember this or not, but like there was this constant fear, right, of annihilation. Mm -hmm. COVID, this pandemic, seems to put kind of that same blanket fear over people. That's what it reminds me of being afraid, right? That someday I could pass, people I know and love could pass. Has have you seen a big impact on, you know, personal satisfaction or, or people's, you know, just the mental assault that comes from, as Maria brought up, the news constantly bombarding us with this and or just an over the, the blanket fear. Have you seen a big impact in that? I think so. I think so. Ultimately, when I hear you talk about the fear, when I think about the news, that's a that's safety. Okay. Right. Our the way that we know safety, bodily safety, body autonomy, the way that 
at one point we were able to trust those around us and now the pandemic has made us distrustful i think in part because of the way that politi poli um, partisan politics have come into this conversation right so rather than coalescing and wrapping our arms around each other and moving through this and validating humanity as as our as our as one of our top priorities we are now in the oh my goodness who can i trust if you know, are you wearing a mask? Aren't you wearing a mask? Can I discern why you're not wearing a mask? That all relates to safety. And, and also, I think there is a very real, very tangible experience across humanity that uh, encompasses the fear of death. So many of us are afraid of dying. It, it is inevitable. Um, all of us will do it at some point, but there's this kind of idea that we have fear around our death. Is it going to be painful? A and can we control it? And so I think it's really about engaging safety in that way that helps you answer those questions for you. So how do you make, how do you make good with the idea that you are going to die? And how do you ensure that you've got a healthy relationship with death? I think going back to that issue around resistance, I think for many of us, we get caught in this kind of, I'm trying to stave off death as long as I can, but we get so intent on ensuring that it's over here and away from us that we're not having a quality of experience in the life that we're living. So how do you, how do you come to terms with death? And how do you experience safety? Maria, I think that's a wonderful strategy. It's one that I've had to employ for myself. I can't, I want to be informed. I get the news when I can. You know, it's important to know what's going on in the world, but I can't watch a ticking death count. I can't do that. It, it impairs my ability to engage with the world authentically and vulnerably. So, I like to know what's going on, but I keep it over here so that I'm in control of my sphere. And I think a lot of that is, it goes back to that conversation around self-awareness and around wholeness. So how aware are you of what's going on around you? Because for many of us, when we don't feel safe, we pick up strategies to help us either numb or to help us feel safe. And that can be any variety of things from alcohol, to drugs, to food, to sugar, to exercise. Any, you can, I think just about anything you can become addicted to, right? It is um, a relationship with something that prevents you from engaging in the wholeness of your human experience. Is that helpful? Um, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, I appreciate that. Does anyone else have any questions? Aubrey, I have one. I'm trying to figure out how to phrase it. Uh, it's like, how do you take um, the ideal of being satisfied mm -hmm. on a daily basis? And then, you know, I mean, especially when you have so much going on at times, you're multitasking, everybody thinks that's a great tool, a skill to multitask and in reality is not necessarily. Right. And really reflect on who you are in the moment. How do you really just take it and just making sure that it's all important to your being? So I think part of that is, it's that awareness, reflective reflection piece. So it's, it's, get, it's becoming aware, satisfaction or whatever your word is, right? This, this self-care word, this lens that you use, this is something I'm committed to. I, and I think also getting really rooted in your why. So a, a large part of my satisfaction centers on, I, I wanna live a long life and I wanna, I wanna ensure that I have a legacy, I'm living a legacy um, that encourages and helps and supports other people, particularly young people. So now I've got this awareness, so how am I gonna do it? And it's that, it's the touch point and it's being very gentle with yourself. You know, if, 
if you have a young child, a, a baby, so to speak, who's learning to walk, the first time the baby takes steps and falls, you don't say to the baby, oh my goodness, why couldn't you take more steps? What are you, like, what's wrong with you? It's like, oh my goodness, this is wondrous. This is beautiful. So what if we allowed ourselves that space and grace of growth? So I'm stepping into this. I'm learning something new. And that's life, right? Life is learning. Life is change. We create false notions of safety with routine and habituation. And that's not the reality of life. For many of us, change is incremental and it happens over time. The way I looked when I was eight years old is not the way that I look now. Look at this gray hair. So really, really, you know, almost being childlike in the effervescence that comes with learning and doing life a different way. And why? Why do you want to do it? Is it because it's your legacy? Is it because you want to spend more time with your partner? Is it because you want to spend more time with your children and perhaps their children? What's your why? So now we're aware. We have a why. And what am I doing? Because when you have an awareness, you often catch yourself on the tail end. It's one of the things that I've noticed in developing patients and caring with my mother. Like I would get impatient, I would get frustrated, and then I'd notice after I got impatient and after I got frustrated, but that's a part of the learning journey. You gotta get it wrong in order to get it right. Because if you're, if you're not getting it wrong or right, you're not engaging with it. So once you learn the process of engagement, okay, so I'm aware. Now I'm looking at my, at how I'm engaging this process. I'm looking at how I am engaging with satisfaction. I'm looking at how I'm allowing this lens to filter my life. Or I've got this lens. I was living life and I wasn't using this lens. So I wonder what it would look like if I used this lens retroactively. So now that I use it retroactively, I'm able to, even if it's just for a minute, my next engagement with whatever it is. Oh, I've got the satisfaction lens. You use it one time, maybe in a day, maybe in a week, maybe in a month, but you've used it. So when you use it, what you've done is you've created that neural pathway and, or you're starting to dig in that groove of the neural pathway. So now I'm using the lens on occasion, but I'm noticing perhaps there are positive reinforcements in what I'm learning and what I'm engaging. So I might want to use this a little bit more, but how would I use it more? Now that's ref reflection, R-E-F-L-E-X-I-O-N. <laughs> it becomes reflexive. So now I use the lens, change behavior. Oh, okay, okay. So now you start back, you're doing life. You've got this lens, you used it once, it worked here. So now I'm gonna use it again. I'm gonna change my behavior and it becomes the feeling good because so many of us have been taught to feel bad, to wait for the shoe to drop, right? And especially when you look at the confluence of our identities, we're constantly on guard. I'm waiting for somebody to say, do be the thing that reminds me that they think I'm not worthy. So I'm constantly engaging with how I think people see me, which also impedes safety, psychological safety at the very least, and sometimes physical safety. So I think it's, it's really the awareness, getting clear and centered on your why, and then thinking about why am I doing what it is that I'm doing and how can I do it differently? And now, when I think about how I, how I can do it differently, I start to apply and it starts to become reflexive for me. Thank you. Sure. Was that helpful? Yeah, very much. So 
if there's any, so we're, we're getting close to time. So um, while everyone's thinking of any follow, uh, remaining questions, I just want to say I put a survey link in the chat. So if everyone can please uh, complete the survey uh, for today's event. And I've also put in uh, an evite to come to June's next event, which are uh, which is how are the children first ask how are the adults, and that will be on uh, January twentieth at six o'clock PST, six p.m. PST. Excuse me. So please, everybody, sign up. We 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 really enjoy hearing from Dr. Christian. Uh, love the event. So. Uh, any were there any follow up questions? Don't be shy. You can write in the chat if you have questions, and I can read it as well. Please don't be shy. I want to remind you back to that slide, right? Like, if there's one more thing that you could do to get satisfaction out of the time that we've spent together, what would it be? What do you? What would you like to hear? What What question do you need to have? answered or do you need to ask or is there something that you'd like to say i just, you know while, while while people are writing or thinking i'd, I'd also like to say I, I like how you brought up you know the concept of satisfaction uh, element of self-care because uh, you know when we go back to our original definitions it was around for me it was around being able to unplug right but um you know, I think adding this element of fulfillment with self, you know, I, I think that's very important. And it's something that we can control with, with ourselves, right? You can control what you're chasing or when you feel like you're fulfilled. So I, I appreciate you bringing that up and thank you. That's the, that's the goal, right? Because I think our liberation is collective, but it's also individual. It's it's got to be held by the visionaries, right? By the people who can envision what it looks like. And then those folks who are willing to say, this is possible. Let, let me show you how. And if this doesn't work for you, then figure out the skill set that you need that will work for you. So we're not hamstrung into a way of doing. It's, it's a way of being. And the experience experience of being, right? Because our humanity isn't bound in what we read. It's not bound in what we watch on television. It's what we feel when we are one with each other. And so if we can really get into that feeling place, right? So thinking about going back to what you talked about, Aubrey, and, and feeling it in your, you know, something that's external to you. So if you're feeling it now, what is your experience of life? How are you moving in a way that feels good to you, that encourages other people to feel good, that models for them how they can live their lives? And so it doesn't have to look the way that yours looks, but authenticity and vulnerability, those are things that we experience with each other. I can't be authentic and vulnerable in a silo. I can't do it by myself. I have to have the validation of my humanity. And so when we get really rooted in a lot of what we're doing is liberatory. And if young people have this experience where it's felt and not external to their experience, now we start shifting paradigms in a way that supports the forward movement of humanity. And that has a tendency to um, lessen how identity separates us and keeps us from um, from validating the very thing that makes us one with the other, our humanity. Thank you. I got it. So June, I was just going to uh, reference the twenty one day uh, uh, plan that we co developed to just give people a chance to get started on this action. Uh, and I'm so glad that we, I was able to encounter you years ago to get me thinking even more about this topic, just because I just believe it's what's helped me through this pandemic, which gets me to my question, what are you seeing? I mean, what have you seen in these last two to three years? And what I'm saying to people is this is the way of life. There's no ending the pandemic. Like we may have to wear masks forever. Mm -hmm. This is it. 
So what are you saying? What are you seeing as you're getting ready for, let's say the next 25 years of what we hope will be our lives, but nothing's promised. But if you can say the next 25, 50 years, I'm gonna be here. How are you talking to people about this topic, self-care, satisfaction, love, liberation? So I think about it in terms of pants in the grocery store, right? So none of us question wearing pants to the grocery store. It is a given. It's just what we do. And it is remarkable if we were to go to the grocery store and to find that people were pantsless, right? So thinking about the pandemic, if this is the way that we are living our lives, then it becomes the way that we live our lives. And satisfaction isn't dependent on what happens broadly outside of who we are. It is what we experience together. So if anything, I think it really is about the next 25 years of feeling, because when you get rooted in your feelings, then you recognize that other people have feelings and those feelings are likely similar, not different. So, you know, when you think about the insurrectionists who were in the Capitol, um, on January 6th, a year ago, we still, as human beings, share very similar feelings. So if we can get rooted in that feeling piece, then we can change how we engage and the world that we live in. And it's, I don't know, it, it may sound pie in the sky-ish, but if we think about it, like pants in the grocery store, right? It's just a given, go into the grocery store, go and put on some pants. It's just a given that I wanna feel good in my experience of being a human being. And when I feel good in my experience of being a human being, then other, I reflect that. And then people are like, oh, I have the option to rest into my humanity. And then those 25 years, it becomes less about the time and more about the ways that we're engaging with each other and how we can love each other, how we can live with each other. And I think, you know, ultimately, um, you're not going to dislodge somebody who's having, you know, a breakdown in the middle of a department store about wearing a mask. But I do understand that feeling of frustration and of dissatisfaction. And so I'm not going to try to talk you down. But what if I get rooted in my, in my feeling? I understand what that feels like. Now, that may, that may not be the way that I'm going to live my life. That may not be what I want to do. But I do know those feelings. Those feelings are human. And those feelings are necessary. All of us, to some degree, are feeling something with regard to the ever-changing evolution of the world, which seems to be, um, in large part, um, negative. So if we switch that and we say that this is just what life is, what I find in speaking with older people um, who are in, you know, octogenarians and folks that are in their 90s, what I find is that many of them will say things are different, but the experience of life is the same, right? Things are gonna ebb and flow, they're gonna change. Things are gonna surprise you, they're gonna hurt you, they're gonna frustrate you. So how do we coalesce around that? How do we understand that those feelings are necessary to our liberation and that we can find similarity uh, and coalesce around those things and invite people to do the same. You may, I may invite you 20 times to my home. It may be the 27th, the 32nd, the 110th time that I ask you. But if I keep asking you, if I keep finding my humanity in you, my hope is that you'll say yes. And you're more prone to say yes, because this is an opening now. It's not a one-off. So I want to read, uh, Maria, thank you for posting in the chat. I'll read uh, right now. You just say, <laughs> you say, uh, I just want to say thank you for the, I want to say thank you for the opportunity to learn about this useful topic of self-care in this time of world pandemic, darkness, and insecurity for us. So 
Thank you for that, Maria and June. That, that's a compliment. <laughs> Thank you so much, Maria. Thank you. I, I appreciate your um, willingness to engage and I appreciate everyone for showing up. And I really, really hope that your experience of satisfaction in your life um, is exponentially increased moving forward um, so that you can truly uh, experience and enjoy the love um, that you exchange with your communities and the liberation that you're moving toward. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Oh, we, we have another chat from Barb, Barb Smith. So thank you so much, Dr. Christian. You've given us so much to think about and work on. I appreciate you. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I'm gonna follow your lead, Aubrey. Barb, thank you very much. <laughs> Were there any, so we're at time, so were there any uh, final questions? Okay, so as usual, I'll post this video. This video will be posted on our website. Uh, June, if you could send your presentation, that would be fantastic. I'll post that as well. Yeah, and uh, if anyone has any questions, uh, please just follow up through the website or, um, you know, you can send me an email. Uh, I'll also post the information, that information on the website as well, and we can follow up. So thank you everyone for joining. Uh, appreciate it. Thank you again, Aubrey, Dr. Christian. Oh, Aubrey, oh. oh, just a second. Did Dr. Moore have anything, last comments? He said, he said, thank you everyone. Thanks, Dr. June, excited for the next one. And he said, Dr. June was part of developing the plan. So everybody make sure to check out the 21 day equity challenge. Dot com link that's in the chat. Yep, it's self care and it has a music list. It has a playlist. I wanted to remind <laughs> y'all there's music associated with it. Dr. June, much love. Thanks, Aubrey, sir. Barbara, good to see you. Everyone, thank y'all for joining. Um, thank you for being here, everyone. Thank you. And we'll see you on the next time, uh, June, uh, January 20th.